All right, this is great. I see that Kali is here. Hi, Kali. Um, so I'm gonna invite her to join me in just a minute. Um, but first, I'll give you all a little bit of an update on Tattered Cover, um, which is many of your local independent bookstore. Um, we are still closed to the public, if you haven't heard that yet. Um, we are no longer offering curbside pickup and our phone lines are currently shut down, but you can order books from us online. And we are so grateful um, at how many online orders we've been receiving. So thank you all so much for continuing to, uh, to read, to reach out, to try to build community through art, um, even while we're in these really, really strange times and all stuck inside a little bit. Um, we are doing a few more of these videos. So I hosted Emily St. John Mandel on um, Wednesday for the Glass Hotel. Um, that was fantastic. And we'll have a link for you all to watch that interview if you're interested from our website uh, shortly. And that will have closed captions, as will this video when we update it uh, and upload it to YouTube. Um, we are also hosting Jessica Anthony, the author of Enter the Aardvark, on um, Tuesday next week. McKaylee Osley, our director of events and marketing, will be hosting that event. So that'll be here, 5 p.m. Mountain Time, same same deal. So please tune in if you want to hear about Enter the Aardvark. Um, it's a fantastic new book. And so if you were here uh, hanging out, on Wednesday, then you've already heard me say this, uh, but I don't think it can be said enough times, so I'm going to say it again. Um, and that is, I think that times like these with uh, so much panic in the world and so much sort of frenetic energy, intentionality is one of the first things to disappear. And so coming to you through this video, I want to be very clear about why Tattered Cover has chosen to host events like this and why I have chosen to host events like this. Um, so I'm our adult front list buyer. I don't usually do this sort of um, public facing event, um, but this is really important to me for three reasons. Uh, the first is that when we are hosting someone on an online platform right now, it's because someone at our store specifically or more than one person read their book and loved it. And it is really, really important to us that those authors get to have a platform right now when they may not have, um, you know, folks coming across their book in the bookstore. And so I wanted to talk to Kali about Sabrina and Karina because I loved this book and also because so many booksellers at Tattered Cover absolutely loved this book and we want to give it some space to shine, especially because the paperback is coming out on April 7th. Um, so the, the second reason and the third reason are very tied together. Um, and the first of those is that we believe at Tattered Cover that art is a survival resource. And this is a time when we are all sort of forced to reckon with what what is a survival resource and we want to say that we are here and art is and will always be our number one priority um i'm sad to have had so many conversations recently about how sometimes art is the first thing to go there are so few safety nets for it and so we are here to be its net to hold it to elevate it um, and to bring it to you and we will always be here to do that sorry about that the last piece is that um, I'm hearing so much right now this narrative of how much we all need to support small businesses. And I think that's absolutely true. There are so many small businesses that need our support right now, but I'm also not really interested in participating in this story of um, someone else needs you and so you should help just for that reason. I think that it is much more important for us to put our attention behind the idea that we all need art and that artists are the world builders of our society. And if we hope to get to a place where the world looks different than it does now, then we just need to elevate art. And it has nothing to do with um, loyalty or, or um, what we should do for our local community. I think it's really, really fantastic and we love you for supporting <laughs> a small business. But also I want this to be an exchange where um, we are providing a service in, in bringing art into the world that everyone 
maybe needs us badly as we need their business. And so with that, um, I am going to bring Kali Fajardo and Stein here um, in just a moment, and I will tell you a little about her. She is the author of Sabrina and Karina, which many of you may have read at this point. It's been out in hardcover for about a year. Um, it was a National Book Award finalist and also a Penn Bingham Prize finalist and a Story Prize finalist. Um, it was longlisted for the Aspen Words Literary Prize. And Kali is also the 2019 recipient of the Denver Mayor's Award for Global Impact in the Arts. Um, she has had work in Gay Magazine, The American Scholar, Boston Review, Bellevue Literary Review, and on and on and on. She's received fellowships from Yaddo and the McDowell Colony in Hedgebrook, um, and she is from Denver. So I am going to bring her on here right now. We'll see if I can operate the phone. There we go. Hello. Hey. Hey, how are you? Oh, this is so fun. <laughs> cool. Thank you for having me, Tattered Cover and Afton. I'm really excited to be here. Of course. I'm so excited to have you in my living room, but figuratively in Tattered Cover. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this is pretty Yeah, you're saying like you don't normally do the the speaking. So I haven't ever, like, this is really cool for me to see you in this new role. <laughs> yeah, well, it's great to see you here also. Obviously, we've had you um, in the store, and it seems like you've done a lot of events in the past year. Um, yeah, but... I've been doing a ton of events. But, um, yeah, my Tattered Cover event was, like, one of the highlights of my year. Just, like, in my life, you know, someone from Denver. I was like, oh, and now I get to do a digital event with you guys. So I'm, I'm really honored. Well, thank you. Everyone here should know that on the day that her hardcover came out, Kali went around to every single tattered cover location to sign books for us. And she also went to Book Bar, I think, right? Book Bar and, and West Side Books, where I worked. And I don't, I just wanted to see you guys. I mean, I wanted to see my book, but also I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. <laughs> I was a bookseller for so long. So to become an author who was a bookseller, like I still want to, I always want to come in. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I love that. Well, thank you. Um, so we have about 30 minutes, so I'm just going to dive right into asking you some questions about your book, if that works for you. Yeah, awesome. For, for anyone who is watching this, if you sent in a question to either Kali's Instagram or to the Tattered Cover Instagram, I have all of your questions here, and we will get to as many of them as we can um, at the end. So, um, okay. I guess I want to start with, so I just reread Sabrina and Karina this weekend, and it was, uh, it's always fascinating to me to reread something and see what sticks out, you know, the second time around. Um, and the thing that was most notable to me um, was sort of the overlaps amongst all of the stories. So I wonder if first you can kind of tell our viewers, um, we know this is a short story collection, but just briefly what it's about um, and what you were sort of going for before we dive in. Sure, yeah. So um, Sabrina and Karina, which is now out in paperback, well, on April 7th, but you can order it now in paperback. Um, so Sabrina and Karina is a collection of 11 short stories that are focused on Chicano women from my own background from Colorado, whose ancestors have been in the state and in the region since the beginning of time. So um, their ancestors are indigenous. And in my own family, my ancestors came off the Pueblos in northern New Mexico. I'm also very mixed. So a lot of the characters are also mixed people. Um, of these 11 short stories, they all focus on women and they're women at different st um, stages in their life. So I think my youngest protagonist is in Remedies, and I believe she. She's 11, I'm pretty sure. And then my, my oldest protagonist is Perla in Galapago, and she is 84 years old. Um, so it began, it sort of just began as honestly my own sort of self-therapy. I was writing these stories because there were a lot of things that had happened in my life that I didn't understand. And I wanted to know why this kind of pain and violence and a lot of the issues I'd struggled with, of drinking and depression, um, I wanted I wanted to understand it and figure it out more. Um, but it also it started earlier than that because I was always obsessed with literature and storytelling. So by the time I got into my early 20s, I was sort of obsessively writing stories about women from my background. And then when I got up to the University of Wyoming, where I got my MFA in fiction, 
I had to write a thesis. And I looked at all these short stories that I had been writing with the help of my mentors. And they were like, do you know that you're like doing the same thing over and over again <laughs> from different angles? And I was like, no, they're all unique and they're all so special. Um, <laughs> but it really took like outside writers to look in and say, you have a singular voice, you're doing something over and over. And then from there, I was able to take that knowledge and I was able to refine them and to group them together as a collection and into a cohesive collection of that. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. so that that does lead really well into this thing that I noticed, right, of all of the overlaps between the stories. So if you haven't read the book, or maybe, you know, I didn't even necessarily notice this the first time I read the book, um, there are, like, the same last name is used in a lot of the stories. So we meet the Cordova family in the first story, and then in the second, in, in Saurita, which is a fictional town um, yeah. on the of Colorado. And then in the next story, we have someone who has the last name Cordova. And then seven stories later, we have another family of Cordovas who are um, and the sort of back and forth between Denver and the Western Slope. And so I'm curious if this was on purpose or if this was done later. No, and I'm also, sorry, it actually, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just, oh, I was like, I wish I could say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a great auntie in one of the stories who is briefly mentioned. And then the next story is, Presumably that ant's story. Um, it's the yeah. same name. I'm curious yeah. about that. You found the Easter eggs. Those are like really, <laughs> those are planted in there like really quietly. Uh, but thank you. I, I'm honored to have readers read so closely like that um, because everything, every sentence I write is intentional. Every word is intentional. So anytime that you see overlap, like I did it on purpose. <laughs> um, one of the things that I'm really obsessed with is sort of the, you know, the Manito, New Mexican diaspora. And these are all the families that had left northern New Mexico, southern Colorado, like my family did in the 1930s. And they came up to Denver. And there are a lot of families that are like that. And it's sort of that history wasn't always retained. But one of the mm -hmm. things that was retained were our last names. So I know... Fajardo is one of my last names, and so is Anstein, but I also know the, the Lopez side of my family and the Luceros and the Gallegos and all those, you know, all those different names, they mean something. And they're names that are very common from an area. So the Cordova family is a research name. It's a, it's a very common name from that area. And so when I was picking the names, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to make them part of this cluster. And um, even the first names are they are all researched and pulled off census records and things like that. But I did refine it later during edits. So at exactly. first I was like, I'm just gonna write these and be like wild and just see what, what grows. And then later on, I, when I was putting this together as an actual book and not just like one story I was sending out at a time, I was like, okay, I want this to feel like a real community. And a right. real community has cousins and uncles and sisters of sisters and friends of friends that were married and left out of the family somehow. <laughs> but all of those, I mean, all of that overlap is a natural, so it, it's, I wanted it to feel like realism. So I'm glad that like there's overlap in the family like that in that way. Like if you go with me somewhere in Denver, that's in a certain part of town, you might run into my cousins just like walking <laughs> down the street. That's just, <laughs> it might just happen like that. That's great. <laughs> Um, then, then of course, I'm also curious about the details that are carried over and why specific things, um, you have these plastic marigolds that show up in a number of stories. You have, um, a mother, a grandmother cooking menudo in a number of stories. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Chanel number five shows up in a couple of stories. It so why these things? <laughs> um, I think just, again, realism, like, my family didn't make menudo once. Like they made it over and over again, uh, either for a hangover or for a funeral. You know what I mean? Like so, just like the realism of like those things that are normal to me and my community, they should be normal to the reader of this book. Um, marigolds, they represent death in a lot of ways and honoring death and Dia de los Muertos. So all of those symbols that are in there, they should be doing multiple jobs so they should be you know filling in as flowers but the flower should also remind you of death and that would tie you into a culture so i always think about using my details just getting a lot of mileage out of them um again like when i was doing edits there were some things that came up over and over again that weren't necessary um 
after a while, people got it that my characters usually have long black hair. So I didn't need to describe that every single time. <laughs> um, but again, like when I was setting them out piece by piece, sometimes mm -hmm. those, de those details didn't feel like they were accumulating in such a way until you read the whole book as a collection. Right. I mean, it's like beyond my wildest dreams that you guys read it all at once. Like I was just struggling for like so long to just get one person to read one story. So the fact that I have readers now that have read the whole book, I can see all those different similarities. I'm like, oh, I love it. <laughs> it's such a good feeling. <laughs> well, I can tell you a lot of people have read your book. I say yeah. <laughs> as a person who sees the sales numbers <laughs> every week. Oh, really? Thank you. I, I'm like, I told my agent, like, never tell me. I don't want to know. <laughs> no, you're, yeah, well, it seems like a lot of people in, in Colorado and shopping at Tattered Cover have read your book. And I'm excited. Yes, they, I'm very appreciative of you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so details. You are clearly, I feel like, very well known for your details at this point. Um, and I'm really interested in the details about Denver. Um, you know, this is such an incredible book to read as a person who's from Denver, um, you know, because how often do we see Cheeseman Park or Colfax or Wadsworth, you know, these places in the books we read, we yeah. just don't, then, you know, don't. So yeah. cool. um, and so I'm, I'm in reading it. I was very curious about if you considered who your audience was when you were writing it. Um, Mostly because, you know, you say things like Colfax Avenue rather than Colfax, um, which is clearly to make clear to someone that this is a street, right? Um, to someone outside of Denver. Well, I actually, I like how it sounds. I think it sounds prettier. So <laughs> that's what I, but yeah, no, I go on with your question. I love this. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think that the details about Denver are lead to one question about audience. And then also the fact that you're sort of illuminating um, a history about Denver that is not in any way unknown, but definitely not published very often. Yeah. Right? It has been yeah. sort of left out of um, a bigger common discourse. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious about how that plays into how you think about audience as well. Yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a great question. And like, oh, I love how closely you read because yeah, uh, you as a color or as a Denverite, you know that we just say Colfax. Mm -hmm. um, but there were things that I had to build out like the map of the world a little bit. Um, and part of that was just sort of laying out east side, west side, like allowing people who aren't from, I mean, it, I didn't have an audience. So let me back up and explain. Um, the audience was me as a younger person. So I was writing the book that me as a, a girl in her late teens or a woman in her early twenties, if I would have found my book, I wanted a book that was going to help me feel seen and help me explore emotions that I had never seen on the page before. Um, so the fact that I do have an audience, that has been one of the most surprising, wonderful aspects of this. But I, I hate to hurt their feelings and let them know that I didn't even know they existed when I wrote it. Um, so what I really was trying to do, <laughs> I mean, they didn't exist when I wrote it. They, I mean, they did exist, but they didn't exist as an audience yet. Um, so I think what I was trying to do right. was I, I had read about New York City for so long. I had read books that were set in California. Um, I had never read about us. And I found Lost in the City, um, the short story collection by Edward P. Jones. It's one of my favorite books of all time. And the way that Jones wrote about this African-American community in Washington, DC with such eloquence and such beauty, I thought, oh my gosh, I wanna be able to do that for Colorado. And so in some ways, I was noticing how landmarks were used in that book and how directions were used in a way that didn't confuse me. So even if Cheeseman Park was thrown out, people who don't know about that park will get enough detail to feel like, okay, I have an understanding of what this park is like. And my hope is that readers will actually, they'll look these places up, they'll look at old maps, um, and I'm also really interested in the naming of things. So I, I joke around about the Highlands not being really the Highlands, it's the North side inside the book. Mm -hmm. And hopefully if someone's not familiar with that, they'll go and look up the history and think about why names have changed around Denver. Um, but I obviously like the book has been able to reach people outside of mm -hmm. our city. And I, I just think it's such a nice treat though when you are inside of a literary space and you can read about yourself. Um, and so that, that to me has just been one of the m most exciting things about publishing this book is that we have another Colorado book 
And for so long, the Colorado books were mostly by white men. Right. And it was, it was just so hard for me to see myself in those books. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the North Side and, you know, the sort of renaming. And a lot, a lot of Sabrina and Karina also talks about the West Side. Um, and so I'm interested in, obviously, you have this sort of violent current of gentrification running through the entirety of your book. And I'm curious what role you see that playing both in the book and maybe in whatever stretches forward from this book for the audience that you have found in writing it. Yeah, <laughs> it was funny. I did a I did a book club recently, and someone said, "Are you used to having only like white people at your readings?" And I was like, "No, actually." <laughs> like, so I think like I I I know that a lot of people who would be considered gentrifiers have read the book, but mm -hmm. I actually don't get engaged with them as much as people who come from my community who feel displaced. Mm -hmm. um, so I hope when they read the book um, that they they're just sort of understanding that there is an old history and there are people here who actually exist, that we aren't just, we didn't just vanish and that the, the history of Denver is rich and storied and it didn't just begin like a decade ago with gentrification. Right. So that's one of my hopes for this book. And like, if, you know, like I, if they want to give it to more of their friends and family members to help do that, that'd be really cool because I just, right now I feel like I'm not, sometimes I am confused by some of the questions I get from like newcomers to the city who are asking me, um, I mean, they're just asking me for a lot of resources about how to understand gentrification. And I think I wrote, I wrote a piece of art that can help you experience some of those emotions, but it's really up to the people who moved here, who came here and took over these neighborhoods to do the homework, <laughs> to figure out how do I best support the businesses that are already here? How do I honor the history that exists? And how do I get along with my neighbors without alienating them? And right. to them, I can't really like, I can't really answer those questions, but I hope um, through this book that they can feel sort of a deeper sense of empathy. And that's what I hope any any work does. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, it's just, it has been nice though to feel, to feel voiceless for so long and to feel invisible for so long. And then suddenly because of Tattered Cover, this book has been on like the local bestseller list off and on for a year. So I know that people in our community are reading it and I know that it, it might be having a ripple effect that I don't, I don't quite understand as the author. Right, right. Yeah. It's so interesting how art can sort of reach away from starting point, right? Like reach yeah. away from the creator and, and become a whole world of its own. Yeah. I mean, I love that. And I think that is like, I mean, so many things I learned about through literature that I then became passionate about in other ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that maybe Sabrina and Karina might be like a gateway drug. If this is the weed of gentrification in Denver. Okay, I don't know, but maybe. <laughs> like, if it can get them thinking about these issues on a larger scale, I would love that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so sort of on that, since you mentioned storytelling a lot and sort of the importance of storytelling to you, and um, whenever I first open a book, the first thing I do is read the dedication. And then the second thing I do is read the acknowledgments. And then, oh. right? So your dedication says, for my mama and papa, creators of artists. And your acknowledgments begins with... Um, to begin, I thank my ancestors who started their work as artists and storytellers generations before I was born. And so from that, of course, I have to ask you about the role that art and storytelling have played in your life and, and also maybe how you want to, to build a future using art and storytelling. Well, the simple answer is art and storytelling is my entire life. Like, I everything I have done, every, every move I've made across the country to all these diverse locations. I lived in Key West, I lived in South Carolina, I lived in San Diego, I taught in Durango. Everything that I have ever done since I was 15, 14 years old has been to further my love of storytelling and literature. And I think that is something that I inherited from my family. Mm -hmm. And the reason why storytelling was so important to us is because we didn't really exist in a lot of the official state archives or the history classes. I don't remember ever learning about us in elementary school. I remember having this really surreal experience where we had to dress up as Native American.